We're, welcome to another edition of Worth Watching. I'm Dennis Fawcett. Eric Olson's over there. He's now the producer, the director, the cameraman, and the cue card guy. Um, like we told you last week, we have one of the cast members from The Wizard of Oz, the first little Oscar. And uh, Meinhard Robbie is his name. And welcome to Worth Watching and to your beautiful wife. Um, let's, let's start out now. We were talking a little bit before we started filming. And uh, you started out in the 30s at the World's Fair in Chicago. Yes, I was 17 at the time. Chicago World's Fair in Midget City was my first uh, job. And I, we, I was going to school, and I got the position under the condition that I would be there in time for a fair opening. Well, of course, that was a month before the school year was over. So I had to do a little convincing with the professors to allow me to leave school a month early to attend, to, to in order to be at the Chicago World's Fair uh, in time. Oh, I see. And then, and this was what, 30s? This is 1934, Chicago World's Fair. And how many years did you work at the Chicago World's well, Fair? Well, just that one summer. Well, that's right, because it was the World's yeah, Fair, okay. And I left, in other words, I left school, left for, uh, the job early in fall in order to go back to school. And what, what, did, what did you do at the fair? What was your job? At the Chicago World's Fair, I was barker at a souvenir stand. So in other words, they sold, they sold like little plaster pairs, things? Well, this, this particular stand was a... Uh, operated by a Japanese gentleman. He had little Japanese uh, trinkets and stuff like that. Uh, oh, I see. Odds and uh -huh. uh, stuff. And of course, the idea, the object was that people walking past your stand, you have to get their attention and say, judge what might be of interest to them to get them to come over to stop at your stand because they're going to, in the time they walk eight feet, you have to accomplish the whole thing because you're never going to see them again. Okay. So it's a one-shot deal. Now, did being a little person, did you attract more attention to that booth, or? Well, uh, every booth or every store in in Munchkin City or Midget City, as it was called, every booth was operated by another midget. Oh, I see. So, so that was the whole the whole affair was called Midget City, and we had a barker out front, and only the p people that would come in to see the midgets. And every 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 store, every booth had a midget operating it. Oh, I see. But now, actually, the the correct term is little person, correct? Well, that's what the, that's the proper terminology now, and, right? But back then, you were called midgets. That's correct. That's what the public called us. That's a shall we use the word a slang term or vernacular? Oh, I see. It's not a uh, a legal or medical term. I see. And then you said you were going to college back then too. That's right. I, w I was going. I was attending Northwestern College at Watertown, Wisconsin. And, and what years were that? Well, I started there in the fall of '32. Oh, I see. And then let's see. And what the Wizard of Oz was what '39. Well, well, uh, it was at least '39. Our Munchkin City sequence was filmed November and December of '38. Oh, really? And then the, finally, the whole picture was finally released in August of 39. Now, where were you when you learned that they were looking for little people to be well, in? Well, let's use the word, we had a midget grapevine. In other words, the little people around the country, whenever there was a job or uh, opening or something, the word spread around rather rapidly. So that when I heard that MGM was going to make a movie, that they wanted as many little people as they could get, why well, it was, uh, I tried to convince Oscar Mayer to give me a leave of absence for a time to get out to go out there because I felt well this would be uh, an extra uh, shall we say a little uh, shall we say venture to go out there. Oh, for I the see. Movie. So then, actually, I got ahead of myself. So actually, then you, uh, Eric tells me you actually went to the original Oscar Mayer, correct, and and said I can be little Oscar. Right. And you had to convince him to let you be little Oscar. Right. In other words, I explained to him, to the company that uh, at that time Philip Morris was doing a bang up job on radio as a living trademark for Philip Morris cigarettes. So I said, well, now look at you, can you see what a tremendous job this live personality is doing for, you, doing for them as an advertising media? And I said, I can do the same thing for you. And of course, what really uh, was the clincher, so to speak, was the fact that I could speak fluent German and could sell in German to all the old German butchers. Oh, I see. Now, 
So did, were you like on a national wide uh, campaign for and commercials and stuff? Not, not originally. At, in other words, in 37, they were just feeling their way along. In other words, we, they used uh, uh, store promotions, in other words, advertising. Uh, at, at Little Oscar will be at this supermarket for a uh, demonstration this week and, and so forth. So, uh, so from 37 till 40, uh, we were just doing uh, newspaper advertising. So we didn't get into the television program until they moved me to Philadelphia in 1950. That's when we originated the TV program. Okay. So then you talked Mr. Mr. Meyer and letting you be Little Oscar, and this was, what, 38, you said? 30. Uh, that was in 37. 37. And then when you found out about they were looking for little people for that the Wizard was, of Oz. That was in, in other words, mid, so we say September 38, and then we I went out to okay. California on my own. And Mr. And Mr. Meyer gave you a leave of absence for your job there to do this. That's right. Okay. And so you get to California, I take it was Hollywood. Well, no. But uh, that time uh, wasn't Hollywood. Uh, well, it isn't even to this day. Hollywood is the business center. Uh, the studios are located out in different areas. In other words, MGM was located in Culver City. Okay. Which at that time was a suburb of L.A. Now it's just a little, uh, cube, a little hunk inside of L.A. I see. So then what? You went down and stood in line at, a, at the well, studio? Any, or? Well, let's use the word that any little person who showed up at the front door of MGM was, was, hot, was admitted at, or hired as a munchkin okay. on the spot. But only so many people got talking roles. Well, that's right. This was a matter of what the script called for, and the casting director decided who, who would get certain parts. Now, for instance, the first part selected were the three young ladies who were the Lullaby League girls, because they were the only three who'd ever had toe dancing lessons. So they, they automatically became the three Lullaby League girls. Oh, I see. Then the next part that was, uh, next part that was assigned was probably the mayor. The mayor was born in Germany, had a German brogue and an ample stomach, and they added a little bit more to it to make him as a mayor. Okay. And then the next part, they, they, picked, they lined up about eight, they, well, put, excuse me, they lined up a number of fellows, and they picked three fellows who were exactly shoulder to shoulder, who became the lollipop boys. Okay. If you'll notice, I'm going to ever see it, watch the picture again, you'll see them all lined up shoulder to shoulder. One was 17 and one was 40. Oh, I see. But they were all the same size. Okay. And then, so how did you get your role well, as the, the uh, corner? the casting director picked about, out about eight of us to say the lines for the Munchkin Coroner. And because I had been doing some uh, public speaking for, uh, shall we say, uh, clubs and so forth, I probably enunciated a little bit more distinctly than some of the others is, okay, you're the coroner. Oh, I see. And so then you got your, you got your role in The Wizard of Oz, and uh, the, you obviously signed a contract. Yes, we had to sign a contract for the duration of the picture. And, and how long did you, was your contract? Did well, you I, I think, if I remember correctly, the contract was a little bit open-ended at the end because they didn't know exactly how long it would take to shoot. Oh, I see. But now you were telling me last year when we talked that part of the uh, part of your contract, you had to show up every day in costume, even though you were already done film, so other people could come and see the Munchkin City. Well, the, the point was this: every morning, every, while we were doing the shooting, you see, first of all, the costume director of the of the picture measured every single munchkin individually and designed an individual costume for each munchkin according to their role. So it took five weeks for the costume department to make up all these costumes. During those five weeks we were rehearsing, in other words, all our dance steps so we'd be on the right yellow brick at the right note and facing the right camera and facing the right spotlight. So then oh, when, I the see. when the costumes were finished, then they were ready to start shooting. Was this a real big set? Oh, yes. It was uh, as big as, a, well, let's say bigger than several basketball auditoriums. Oh, really? Oh, those sets are huge. They look like a huge warehouse. Wow, that's neat. Um, so then you were practicing and all that stuff. Now, let me ask, did you get to keep your costume? Oh, no. After all, that was all, that was all MGM property. Did you get any mementos at all from oh, making no, the film? Oh, no, absolutely none. Nothing? No, not at the time. 
you see, and after, uh, let's see, in later years, uh, Mr. Turner purchased all of MGM properties, and of course he inherited or purchased all their film rights and acquired all the costumes. Right. Well, the costumes were no interest to him. So the cost, although those costumes were auctioned off to the public, so collect, collectors from all over the country came in and bought pieces of whatever and bid on different items that they wanted. So your costume's probably in a collection somewhere. Isn't it? That's right. You should have it. Well, Ted uh, Turner, give him his costume. <laughs> well, the point was this: I'm about uh, 12 inches taller now than I was then, so I'm That's afraid it wouldn't do me much good. How tall were you? Do you remember? Well, I can't give you an exact figure. Let's say somewhere around 44 inches, probably. Okay. Now, when you th when when people my age think about little people, we think about the Wizard of Oz. But we also think about Billy Barty, the one from the Wild. Was he in the Wizard of Oz? No, he when was. He was. Born, he was. Oh, really? Yeah. See, he's a much younger person. Okay. And then we were also talking earlier the movie, the, the black and white. Terror of Tiny Town, which had little people in a western, yes. was actually shot before. That was done the summer before The Wizard of Oz was done. So that they already had a, a, quite a few little people already all there. Of, practically all the little people who were in Terror of Tiny Town uh, became part of The Wizard of Oz. And did you all stay in the same hotels and stuff oh, like no, that? No, no, no. They only had one little hotel in Culver City, so the bulk of the uh, munchkins stayed in this hotel. but. Many of us were farmed out. In other words, I was happened to be bivouac in a private home uh, with people who were, uh, mo were extras in the movie business. So oh, I that see. I got a lot of, shall we say, inside dope on the on the operations of the movie business from them. Oh, I see. That, in other words, uh, the people who work in the movie business as extras, they are more or less tied to their telephones because they never know when a call is going to come from an agent or a studio to want a certain part. Oh, I see. Now, did, did they pay your expenses the whole time you were there? Well, they, yeah, certainly. They, they uh, in other words, they paid our room, room, with the, or shall we say our room, and of course we ate in the studio commissary. And so obviously you met um, Judy Garland. Well, we worked with Judy Garland, and what happened was that uh, many of the big movie people of M big stars of MGM brought their children in to see the Munchkin City. Oh, like like Clark Gable? In other words, uh, shall we say sightseeing. Okay. So that, and of course the, uh, the, their children would get our autographs and we in turn would get the parents' autographs. So that I have a, a, quite a collection of autograph, autographs and autograph pictures of the major MGM stars of that day. So did you meet Clark Gable? No. I, uh, I did, he was not in, our, in. He was not working in our area of the of the of the, of the uh, what, studio. What about W. C. Fields? No, no. We only ones we met. I have, in other words, I have autographed pictures, uh, naturally, of Judy Garland and uh, Margaret Hamilton and Mar and Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy and uh, um, Spencer, Tracy. Spencer Tracy and Hedy Lamar and uh, the singer. Uh, the, the, the gentleman who I was saying with Jeanette McDonald. Okay. And uh, then also with, uh, well, I have Robert Montgomery and I guess about three others. And then I have a lot of miscellaneous autographs on mm. just on scraps of paper. Well, that's, that's pretty neat. Um, so then you, you know, you filmed your section and the, uh, you uh, went about, hey, I got a cue card here. And uh, when you uh, when you were filming this, did you actually have a chance to sit down and talk to Judy Garland? Oh yes, whenever whenever there was a, a break in the action, when they were rearranging lights, or say, well, let's do this again, and let's let's arrange it a little bit this way. Why we would be, we would so we say sit down with Judy, sit down talk to Judy uh, while they were either so we say before they were starting, and of course whenever there was a break in action. The uh, director would say, cut, uh -huh. and we'd all, sh and then of course when the director says cut, then the, le the electrical man said, save your arcs. In other words, these huge arc lamps up high were very hot and very expensive. So when he said, save, save your, you know, when he said cut, he'd say, save your arcs. Well, the monsters would sit down right where they were, and we'd say, save your arches. 
Oh, I see. Because we had to be on that same yellow brick when they're ready to start shooting again. So they'd shut the big lights off then. Well, yes, right. Because we imagine this, we had 150 36 inch arc lamps hanging from the ceiling to simulate normal sunlight. Okay. You see, all of the picture was shot indoors to simulate normal sunlight. We had no outdoor pictures whatsoever. So you're indoors, it's warm outside, there's no, no air... warmer inside. But there's no air conditioning? No. Well, the ceiling was very high, so we, we, we didn't get the temperature from the lights. It was mainly the radiation from it. Now, how, was Toto a nice dog? Toto was an extremely intelligent dog. He was well-trained. Because if you remember, whenever you see the picture, you'll always see Toto watching Judy Garland. Regarding what other action was going on here, Toto was always kept his eyes focused on Judy. So they only had one Toto. There's no, there's no stunt dog. No stunt dog. <laughs> okay, and and so then you met Ray Bolger. Yeah. Oh yes. They those people all, although they didn't they weren't in the Munchkin City sequence. They all came in to visit. So then. At lunchtime, would you guys all sit around and talk and stuff? Well, no, or? we'd go into the commissary to eat. Oh, I see. Now, you, you stayed in costume to do this? Oh, yeah, because we could see. After all, it took, in the, to give an example, what we had to do. We had to be in the studio at 6 o'clock in the morning for makeup, like, like an assembly line deal, or make, uh, makeup. Then by 7 o'clock, we picked up our costumes. We had to be ready to start shooting at 8 o'clock. Oh, I see. And, and uh, how many hours a day would you spend on the right, set? from 8 o'clock till 6 o'clock. Then you went back to the makeup department to have all the extraneous stuff taken off. <coughs> and then you dropped off your costumes, so it was almost 8 o'clock by the time we were released. And did, did you guys always, another note from the director, and did, were you always able to get your scenes the first time, or did you have to go take, take, take? No, or? because you see, we'd had five weeks of rehearsal while they were, do while they were making the costumes. So there was very little having re re retakes, you get what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, there were a few, but Victor Fleming was our director who also made Gone with the Wind. And he was very, shall we say, uh, congenial or very understanding of the little people. Instead of barking orders, he'd say, well, now let's try it this way or let's try it that way. So that, in other words, he wanted the action a little bit different. He'd say, well, now let's try it that way. So, so he was a very... Uh, shall we say, a very caring and very uh, uh, congenial individual. So when you were doing your, your the yellow brick no n road number and so forth, were any other stars of the movie sitting there watching while no, this no, take place? No, 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 uh -uh. uh During the time of filming, there were no other extraneous people in the studio. So you never went and watched other people film their well, sections? Well, let's, let's put it this way. I saw... Uh, when, when there was a break in the action or when I wasn't in that particular scene, I happened to go across the street to another studio where the, the, the part was being filmed. Remember when they picked up Judy? At, when the monkeys picked up Judy right. and flew away with her? And you looked up in the sky, there were hundreds of little monkeys flying up there. Right. Well, those were all little puppets, all being worked by strings from the side. Oh, I see. That's neat. So, here was the pile of straw. Remember, the straw man said, well, here's part of me over here and part of me over there. Right. So the, line, the monkey said, pulled some of the straw out right. of here. And then the monkey picked Judy up and flew away with it. And I'm supposed to ask you about how they recorded the Munchkin voices. Well, uh, the best that I can explain to you is this, that while they were shooting and I wasn't in the action, I sort of moseyed around behind the cameraman and they had record, they recorded the voices going through an oscilloscope like this so that you can see the high notes and the low notes. And for the girls, they eliminated the low notes so the lullaby league girls sounded like, uh, we are the lullaby league, we are the lullaby league. Well, then again, for the boys, they eliminated the high notes so that our voices shone at, much, at a much lower octave. Oh, I see. Uh, do your line for us from the movie. As coroner, I must aver, I thoroughly examine her. And she's not only merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. How many times have you done that line over the years? <laughs> Millions. Millions? <laughs> After all, that's 56 years ago. It's 56 years ago. Eric, can I have those pictures? We, you brought some pictures along. These are laser copies of the original lobby cards from the movie 
which you have the originals of. Right. Now I want to hold this up because there's a picture of you from the movie holding the diploma. And you say you were, you were actually sh shorter there than you are now. Yes, because much shorter. Because you see, I had this hat, as you can see, is about six inches tall, so that the perception is that I'm taller than the rest of the people. Well, actually, it was that six extra inches on a hat that made me look taller. In other words, we had, here you had the, the gentleman with the spotted hat, with the spotted outfit. These were the aldermen. And then you had one of the soldiers. You had the mayor and the city barrister, and then Judy and myself. Oh, I see. Yeah, if you look real close, you can actually see it does stick up higher. Yes, know. that's very much so. Oh, I see. Now, was Judy Garland a real nice person to work oh, with? Oh, we, we adored her. She was, she, at the time, she wasn't quite 16, so she was what you would call a very sweet young lady. She was that young? Yes, ma'am. She, she uh, during the time of the filming, uh, she had to spend a certain number of hours each day with a tutor in school, according to California law. Oh, I see. So then they, during that time, there would be a stand-in uh, in her place, you know, dressed the same as her, but in with a pair of red ruby slippers so that the cameraman could could sight in on her, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And then when they actually were ready for shooting, then they'd bring in Judy. Time. Okay. Well, um, looks like we're, we've run to the end of this half-hour segment, but we're going to continue this next Sunday night. So stay tuned again next Sunday night at 6.30 for Worth Watching. I'm Dennis Fawcett. And, uh, Eric and Eric Olson's back there behind the camera. <laughs> and we'll continue this another half hour. Thanks. Thank Well, good evening. Welcome to another Worth Watching. I'm Dennis Fawcett. And I'm Eric Olson, as always. Today, the camera's running itself, and we had to have Eric sit on a uh, chair because I don't have enough stools. And also, we're going to hold the mics because we don't have enough mics. And as you can see, this is the second half of our Wizard of Oz. Special edition. Special edition. We have the... Widescreen. No, no. No, it's not. This, no, this, this is pan and... It's not even pan and scan. This is the Wizard Academy. of Oz. Was shot was in shot. Academy. Right. Full so. frame, 1.33 Academy ratio. Now we're getting technical now again, sort of scaring people away. But anyway, we have the actual coroner that pronounced the Wicked Witch dead when the house fell on her. Now, was she really wicked or... Well, after all, she was dead under the house. I didn't get a chance to talk to her, so I don't know whether she was wicked or not. But but you met the good and bad witch, right? Well, we met, and, and in other words, the sister, the other one was the, the, the wicked witch. That was the wicked witch of the East. In other words, that was, she was, shall we say, she looked very wicked when you met her. The, the green one? Yes. Well, all <laughs> wicked witches are green, Dennis. I mean, <laughs> that's true. I mean, you don't, you don't see too many good-looking wicked witches. <laughs> so, then you pronounce her dead, right? Correct. And uh, did you? What was her name? Uh, the, the lady who played the part was Margaret Hamilton. Okay, now the they one didn't even have name. They just had wicked each east wicked witch well, of I mean, the east. Her, her, but her act, her no, oh, name. you wanted that name. Now the one I always found kind of. A, Strange and her voice and everything was was the good witch and Glinda. I can't. Glinda. Glinda. Yeah, what was her name? Uh, Gl Glinda and her real name was Billy Burke. Did you have you had time to sit down and talk with her? No, I'm sorry, I didn't have an opportunity to uh, shall we say visit with with Billy Burke, because she came on set. She had her own stu her own dressing room, her own makeup person. So she came on the set, which was the opening set of the scene, and when that was finished, why she went back to her uh, dressing room, and we did not have an opportunity to, to visit with her. Oh, I see. And we, we last yeah. time, last show, we had some of these uh, actual, now you own, personally own, the actual, the actual lobby card set from Correct. this movie, Correct. right? This is 39. Correct. Now, Eric was talking earlier that when you guys did this film and was all over, you had no idea you were going to have this kind of success, right? Oh, absolutely not, because you see, we only had the script for our little portion of the picture. We had no idea what the rest of the picture was all about. So not until the finished product was on the screen 
did we know what the whole what the whole thing was all about? Oh, I see. Now, did you, when you were finished filming this, did you know that you were up against, like, Gone with the Wind and all these oh, other no, movies? No, 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 because, you see, we had no idea when The Wizard of Oz was going to be released or when Gone with the Wind was going to be released. We didn't know what other, how many other pictures were in production at the time because we only saw our, we were only in this one studio, and with our own group, we didn't know what other pictures were in production at the time. In what? fact, I know several other pictures that were in production. For instance, uh, Hedy Lamar and Spencer Tracy were making a picture called I Take This Woman, was the name of the picture. Uh, Mickey Rooney was in production. He was work making Huckleberry <coughs> Finn. Uh, Jeanette McDonald was working on Broadway Melody of 1939. Now, you see, those ones I saw in, in the production, but there were many other studios that I didn't see. Oh, I see. So, the, but The Wizard of Oz was what? Finished in 39? Yes, it was released to the public in August of 39. And was not gone, was gone to win out before or after the same time? I can't answer that. All I know is they came out in 39. I don't remember the exact date it went as to uh, as to the date that Gone with the Wind was released. Okay, but now Eric didn't go, didn't uh, the Wizard of Oz kind of like flounder for a, a number of years? Well, it was it was one it was an also ran. Let's put it this way. Okay. Among five major pictures that were released that year, in other words, it was uh, Bo Jest, Gone with the Wind, I Take This Woman, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, it was uh, Goodbye Mr. Chips, uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, were all released in 39. So we had, let's say, five major biggies in 39. Okay. It now, was the last action hero of 93. Right. <laughs> but now, <laughs> but also, wasn't the big break for Gone on the Wind when CBS started airing it every year? That's correct. That was when, in other words, that's when it became known to the general public. In other words, uh, prior to that, of course, not everybody had gone to the theater to see Wizard of Oz because uh, at that time, Gone with the Wind had more more hype, more publicity. Well, I see. The first time I seen this was on TV, obviously. I was, wasn't even born. I was in the theater, hopefully. But anyway, th those monkeys scared me. I had nightmares about them monkeys dragging me off. Well, when I was when I was traveling with the picture, almost every day you'd see some somebody come running out of the theater with a youngster screaming and screaming, either because they were scared of the monkeys or the wicked witch. It was either one or the other. They'd have youngsters in their arms screaming and coming running out of the theater. Oh, really? Because it scared me. Yeah. Now I want to just go back for a minute because we're starting to wrap up talking about the picture. But I want to go back to a couple things that, one, I think you, you, it happened before you were shooting, and one that happened during your sequence, and that were a couple of the accidents, because some people might not know about that. One with the Buddy Epson, which I know you weren't shooting yet, and the other with Margaret Hamilton on her, and the elevator yeah. and the fire. Well, you see, when my, when, of course, the Buddy Epson thing. That had happened long before we were out there. So we heard of it, but we didn't know what the details were. Uh, then, of course, the uh, Margaret Hamilton situation, actually, those of us who were working on the set didn't realize what really had happened because they had, they had made done this scene. You see what's supposed to happen. There was little gas jets in the floor, and they... When, the, when she was supposed to come up in the elevator, they had this red smoke. Well, first, when she came up, they had the fire come up first. And then when she appeared, they had the red smoke. And then, she, then there was a fan off stage blowing the smoke away. And there she would be standing there swinging her broom. Well, then when she was supposed to disappear, she rolled back onto the same elevator. And then the smoke was supposed to come first, and she was supposed to go down and then the fire. Well, somebody miscued, and the fire came up while she was still laying there, and of course the fire singed her hair and her uh, eyebrows and melted some of the makeup on her face. But to show you how uh, particular the studio was, they had a man with a wet blanket, a soaked wet blanket, standing just off screen, so that as soon as he saw what happened, he jumped into that elevator, with, covering her with this wet blanket. So that saved her from a lot more serious injury that actually happened. But 
nothing further happened that day because she had had some injury. So they just used the scene just if the scene that had been shot just before. In other words, the director said, well, that was perfect, but let's try it one more time. Well, the one more time is when the accident happened. So they just used the shot that they had done prior. Oh, one, one quick question back to the uh, Yelbick Road scene. How many little people were in that scene? Well, altogether, there were 124 munchkins in the picture. Uh, maybe you didn't see them all at one time because, you see, they had the principal characters in the foreground, and in the background you had a big mix of, shall we say, the crowd of munchkins. And then when the next scene would show, they would mix them up a little bit different, and you'd have the principal characters in the front, and you'd have the whole, the rest of the gang in the background. They'd just mix them up a little different, and it looked like you had a thousand munchkins all together. Now, were all, all of them weren't little people, though, were they? There were some younger, like, children? Well, I'll put it this way. We had three munchkins who were younger, but the studio didn't know how old they were because, after all, somebody that's six foot tall looking down on a three-foot person cannot tell how old they are. So we had three, mun three munchkins that were underage, technically. But they didn't have to go to school because the studio didn't know how old they were. They were just signed up as munchkins. Uh, then at the time of the picture, I didn't know this, I never saw them, but I was told afterwards that they brought in some girls from a dancing studio to sort of fill in more in the background. Now, I didn't know this for years until I read it in a book later on, that they had brought in these other, because they were brought in with a separate chaperone, and they were just in the background. We never knew it. I never knew they were there. And now, with 124 people, we talked about makeup a little bit in the first show, but how did they keep, you know, 124 munchkin costume straight i mean you know from day to day because it took a while to shoot this thing how would they keep that all straight well like i said for the makeup for the makeup the chief makeup man came in and did he said now what are your lines what is your position what is your part and he would artistically draw a makeup on each munchkin that was going to be in the action and then they would take a still picture and they would put that in the file so that when you were, came in for work on the next day, one of the assistant makeup men would get your, your picture out of the file so that you would have the same mustache, the same wrinkles, the same uh, beard or whatever every day. Uh, but we have, of course, to make have uh, 124 munchkins made up, we maybe had 10 makeup men in a line. So there was just like an assembly line job doing all these makeup. Why, well, so you were 22 years old? I was tw 23 at the time. 23 at the time. Now, would you, would you say that of all the little people that you're probably probably the most well-knowing all over the world? I'm sorry, repeat that. I'm of all the little people, would you, from, the, from the movie The Wizard of Oz, you're probably what, the most well-known of any of them all over the world? Well, that's hard to say because many of the other little people have their own uh, followers. For instance, Margaret Pellegrini is one of the uh, munchkins who travels with us now, and she uh, played several parts. She was one of the little ones who were up in the uh, in the in the crane, in the uh, stork's nest, and she was one of the sleepy heads. She once said, "Wake up, wake up, you sleepy heads," and she played several other parts. But she always had a. Uh, the other part, she always had a flower pot hat, so that if you knew knew her, you could spot her in the in other scenes around the picture. So, I mean, in her mind, she might feel that she's the most if it, uh, most well known. Oh, I see. Then I, obviously, you met the wizard. Pardon? You met the Wizard of Oz. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't because he was not in he was not in Munchkin Land. See, so I, see, I've, I'm learning a lot. I always we'll thought see. everybody knew each other, but no, the thing is, it's a big. It it's was a big movie, and it was drawn out in a lot of, of different scenes, in words, and it, it, it's production. Uh, uh, in other words, yeah. they were probably used at least five big studios for this picture. Oh, I see. And we didn't, we only, I only saw one other studio. Some of the other Munchkins had a sneak preview, preview in another studio that I didn't see. So, in other words, there was one studio for, uh, for uh, Emerald City. There was one studio for the Witch's Castle. There was one studio for the poppy field. 
There was one studio that just did the, the mon monkey, monkey scenes when all the monkeys were flying. That was a separate studio. So these were all separate studios set up for The Wizard of Oz. Whatever happened to the to the Munchkin Village, is that, did, does that still exist anywhere? Oh, no, no. I mean, as soon as our picture was done and they finally released it, well, everything was uh, went back into, shall we say, stock or junk or whatever. Okay, but well, you did say in the show last week that a lot of the costumes were auctioned off by Ted Turner. That they, were, they were auctioned off after Ted Turner purchased MGM. And, of course, Ted Turner was primarily interested in the film library and all the films that MGM had. He's been accused of raiding that vault and colorizing a lot of stuff. Yeah, I'm glad he didn't colorize the first part of the movie. <laughs> yeah, it would have been different, wouldn't it? Now, yeah. your wife was also an actress, wasn't she? Well, my wife Marie was in sh show business long before I was. In fact, she had retired from show business before I ever knew there was such a thing. So you were never in The Wizard of Oz? No. No. Were you out there none at the, the time? Troop, none of the troupe that I was in uh, that I know of, well, maybe there were a couple that were uh, in Nander Singer's band. They might have, I know that Mike and Ike were in there, and they were also with the troupe that I was with. But otherwise, uh, I was in vaudeville from 1929 to 1932. I joined the troupe when I was 14 years old, right after I graduated from grade school. And at that time, I weighed 36 pounds, and I was 43 inches tall. And I was like a stick. So you, you a did... A straight stick. So you did like a dance, song and dance number? Sang and danced, yes. And was this you, or were you in like a troupe of... of uh, there were 25 of us in, uh, in Ike Rose's Midgets. In the, okay. Well, we played strictly vaudeville. We, we were traveled with the RKO... Uh, uh, theater chain, and uh, we played on the same bill with Fanny Bryce. Oh, really? At the Palace Theater in New York, and in Chicago at the Palace Theater, we played with Jack Dempsey. Did you ever meet like Eddie Foy or anybody like that? No, I never met Eddie Foy. Because was and that I actually uh, even being with Fanny Bryce? I never actually met her, met her either because she was, you know, they kept everybody they, separate they, again, like the movie. Right. Right. Yeah. And if anybody gave us an autograph picture, well, we, we, we always took it, but we never asked anybody for an autograph picture. Jack Dempsey did, I do have a, an autograph picture of Jack Dempsey, because he called all of, the, uh, all of the midgets into his dressing room one afternoon in between shows, and he gave each of us a, an autographed 8 by 10 picture. I see, so then so you... So I prize that. So I see, then you obviously... Did the Wizard of Oz and was finished up, and, and all the little people went on their separate ways? Right. As soon as the picture was finished, we all scattered to the to four winds. And you met your wife in 1941? That's correct. And uh, I always like to ask this question. Do you remember what you were doing when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, all I, I know, what I was doing, actually, I heard, I was in Baltimore, uh, had been working at a food show all week, and uh, I, I remember that I was at breakfast when the news came over the radio that Pearl Harbor was being attacked, yes. I see. And when did you meet your wife in 41? Uh, well, we met March. her in March of, earlier that year. Now, tell us the truth. Was it love at first sight? No. Because you wouldn't have anything to do with him because you were taller than he was, well, right? the first time I met him, he was a half a head shorter than I was, and I really wasn't interested in anyone shorter than myself. <laughs> Then four and a half years later, he came back, and when we were married, we, he was one inch taller than I, and now he's about three inches taller than I, did at she, least. Did she fess up to that back then? What? Did she, did she, did she tell you that back then? Or? Well, no, it was pretty much at arm's end at that time. <laughs> <laughs> but you just wouldn't let her go, huh? Well, you, in other words, when you meet little people, there are that not that many in the country. You have a you almost sort of say mentally catalog everyone in the country, all the little. In other words, I feel that I've met 95 percent of the little people in the country who have done professional work. I understand there are other many little people yet who are not interested in show business and who sort of crawl back in the woodwork. I think Yuri had a question. Oh, well, what about now? Go if you would a little bit and about the promotion of how. You know, you went on the road for Oz. You said you, you know, traveled with the movie. Right. Go into, like, I guess, how movies were promoted then because it's quite a bit different than it, how it is today. Well, 
First of all, I was working in Chicago, where, and Chicago is the headquarters of several theater chains. And between Oscar Meyer and myself, we made contact with several of these chains so that I traveled with the movie in its initial run uh, for about six months out of Chicago. So I worked through part of, some part of Illinois, part of Indiana, and part of Wisconsin use, uh, following the picture. And I was, of course, still working for Oscar Meyer, so I would uh, have the big Oscar Meyer Wienermobile park out in front of the theater as a little extra attraction, and then I would go on the stage prior to showing the picture uh, to give a little uh, introductory to it. And then after the picture had made its uh, run in the theater, I would be out in the lobby passing out little Oscar Mayer Weenie samples to all the customers. Did, did you get to go on the Wienermobile with them? No, not really. Uh, I mean, uh, if, if there was going to be something close by, well, I might go with him if he was going to be in a parade or something like that. Well, when I was close by, but nothing. When really I was a kid, I would give anything to drive the Wienermobile. or anything in it that you could sleep. Yeah. Yeah. You see, there was in the, 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 in the Wienermobile, there was only space for the driver and myself. Oh, I and, see. And, in other words, we had to crawl over the motor to get up front, up front to the driver's seat. Oh, I see. So you were physically in the lobby of the movie peddling Oscar Mayer. Yes, at, at, after the movie was finished, after the picture was over, I would be passing out weenie samples in the lobby. Were you and Oscar Mayer good friends? Well, yes. In other words, I knew the original Oscar Mayer Sr. who started the company back in 1883. And of course, I started with the company in 1937, uh, and he was working still working at the office in Chicago. And of course, I spoke fluent German. And every morning when I would came in the office, Mr. Meyer would, we'd have a little chat for, shall we say, past the time of day in German in the morning. And you also told me that you, because you could speak fluent German, you you uh, helped sell products, Oscar Meyer products, to German butchers? That's, that's correct. That was probably the key factor in my starting to work for Oscar Meyer because I was fluent in German and I could uh, sell to German trade. Uh, in other words, just not only discussing the product, but telling how it was made, what the ingredients were, and so forth. Because as a young man at home and, and the farm in Wisconsin, we had made uh, various kinds of homemade German sausage. How, how would you say was it was in German? I wouldn't. Well, we. I wouldn't say. We wouldn't begin to translate it. I don't know how they translate it. Oh, I see, because it's everything's kind of different. In right. other words, to give an example, uh, the pre the previous picture that had been made about little people was, of course, uh, oh, coming up with the name. I can't. Tarantino. No, no. Uh, uh. The one they call them the the, the Lilliput, Lilliputians. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, Gulliver's right. Travels. Gulliver's Travels. In other words, they called them Lilliputians. In other words, that name was coined by the author who wrote that book. And of course, when it was translated to German into German, they were Lilliputaner. So over in Europe, all the little people were known as Lilliputaner. Now, because our organization is known as Little People of America in German, now it's called the uh, or the or decline a mansion. Oh, I see. You know, we should also say that you are Eric's cousin, correct? Correct. Yep. Correct. You no, know, I have to admit to you, he told me he two years ago. Me, two you? years ago, he says, my cousin was in the Wizard of Oz. He was the coroner. I says, yeah, right, Eric. And here I am today talking to him. I can't believe this. I mean, I'll never doubt him again. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go back to the war a little bit, because you got an interesting story, you know, because, you know, you've told me and... You know, a story about, you know, you tried to go out and get a job, you know, as an accountant, and they wouldn't give you a job. They, you know, laughed at you and said, why should I hire you? Well, of course, when the war came around, you wanted, you know, to help out, too. Well, yes, but most of my uh, acquaintances of my age group were going into service, and I felt that somewhere along the line, there must be a spot for me. Well, because I was working then as the world's smallest chef, I decided the first place I tried was the Navy. I said, maybe you could use a, a small chef in a submarine. Well, they said, huh, you're kind of off base because even the chef in a submarine has battle stations, and that's in the torpedo room. So, of course, you wouldn't fit in that. So the next place I tried, I of course, the Air Corps didn't want any small people, but the official auxiliary 
of the Army Air Corps at that time was known as the Civil Air Patrol and is still in existence. And as a civilian, I volunteered and signed up with a civilian air with the Civil Air Patrol, bought a Boy Scout outfit, and we had, a, a, shall we say, served as an instructor with navigation and meteorology for all the young fellows who wanted to get in service who didn't want to be GI Joes but want to hopefully get in the Air Corps. So by my teaching navigation and meteorology, they were able to, uh, shall we say, convince the recruiters that they were ideal material for the Air Corps. So all my students got in the Air Corps. Oh, I and see. I, so and for me, I, at that time in 1943, I was the smallest pilot in uniform. Life. Boy, you have had a you have had a full life, man. You've done a lot That's of stuff. That's just the start of it. That's just, and uh, unfortunately, we're we're running short of time. Last hour, the last week, you did your line from Wizard of Oz. Can you, we do it one more time for us? Oh, certainly. As coroner, I must aver, I thoroughly examine her, and she's not only merely dead; she's really most sincerely dead. Beautiful. That's great. Will you? Next year, if we still have our TV show, we probably will. <laughs> you guys come back on again? Well, thank you. We'll try. Yeah. Up here. Yeah. 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 They're not up every year, but they get around because they're all at Oz festivals and traveling. And he's a horticulturist, and well, Marie helps out with that in Florida. So, very busy, busy retired pe people. And, and, but also, you travel all over the country doing Oz things, right? Correct. Basically, uh, most of the Oz festivals that we go to are east of the Mississippi. We have one in this October we expect to be in Liberal, Kansas. I see. Well, unfortunately, we're out. Of, I wish we had more time. We were out. Well, Eric, we told we told the people that we would have the, the corner from the Wizard of Oz. And we, we deliver. And we delivered. That's more than Dave Gray can do. <laughs> <laughs> New no. Scene 15 didn't deliver. No. WISC TV 3 didn't deliver. No. Channel 27 didn't deliver, but we delivered. Yep. <laughs> and we'll keep Thanks. delivering, so keep watching. Yep. We'll see you next week. You're going to mangle this the way you're Oh, I'm around. sorry. <laughs>